prayer. She doesn't feel good. Uh, but we appreciate you being here. We're here to encourage the saint, help the hurting, and embrace all people. Would you look at your neighbor real quick and just uh, slap him a high five and say, I'm just so glad you're here this morning. I'm glad you're here this morning. If you're a first-time guest with us, we would ask you to uh, get that bulletin that you were handed, and inside there is a uh, connection card. We would ask you to fill that out and either drop it into one of the offering boxes or at the Welcome Center. If you turn it in at the Welcome Center, we have a little gift we'd like to give you. And so if you'd do that, we'd appreciate it. I'd like to stay in touch with you, let you know what's happening at Tri-State Worship Center. We don't take up an offering in a traditional way. We're not going to stop the service here in just a little bit and pass the hat. But we do ask you to be faithful in your giving by uh, dropping your tithe, your offering, your building fund commitments, your missions giving uh, into these boxes that are on the wall located throughout the building. Or you can text to give at 740-370-4342. Or you can go to our website, tswc.org. Or you can uh, swipe your card at the kiosk that's out in the foyer. But we would ask you just to continue to be faithful in your giving. And uh, as you do that, we would appreciate it. If you have your cell phone, which I know most of you do, get that. Go to TSWC, TSWC, which is our public page. There's a video going right now, our live video. If you would like that and then share it onto your page so that uh, people that are your friends that maybe aren't my friends, although I can't imagine any of your friends not being my friends. Thank you, Dennis. But if you would share that, that would uh, help us get the word out and the good news of Jesus Christ. If you do that, we'd appreciate it. Um, Shannon Brothers, come on up. Carolyn, come on up with her. Shannon Brothers is going to uh, give us an announcement about the nursery, and then after her, Carolyn Barnett's going to speak about our blood drive yesterday. Do you love these two ladies? If so, let them know. Good morning. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have walked past the nursery and seen that there is um, a piece of paper. It's a schedule actually taped to the door. Um, there are blanks in that schedule. I need help, okay? Um, not, I'm not asking you to be on in our rotating every six week, yes, every six weeks um, schedule. I'm just asking you to pick a day. That if you see a blank, fill a need, pick a day, help me out, okay? Um, if we don't have anybody sign up, there will not be any nursery that day, okay? You'll have to listen to them in here. So, um, also, if your heart is not in being in the nursery or feeling that need, find another one in this church, okay? Yes, <laughs> um, because I know that there are lots of ministries in here, lots of places that you can plug in and be involved not just in the not just in the nursery, but because not everybody's able to be in there, right, Pastor Terry? <laughs> um, he's volunteered, but I told him we kind of needed him up here. So, um, if you guys seriously, if you guys see that need out there, please um, fill it. Talk to somebody you know who's really good with children, um, and let me know when you do feel that, because I will get in touch with you and remind you and and talk with you and kind of get you acclimated to all the kiddos back there. Thank you. Thank you, I hope somebody signs up for the nursery. How many of y'all was at the blood drive yesterday? Okay, anybody that helped me in any way, shape or form, we had food workers, we had registration workers, we had greeters, we had all kinds of people. Stand up. Come on now, no more there's more than one or two. Everybody. How many of you all actually came here yesterday and donated blood? Stand up. Raise your hand if you donated blood and volunteered. Double whammy. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I had a picture I wanted to share how the blood drive went. <laughs> As you can see, it was highly exciting. <laughs> Sorry. I know. We just like to tease them. But I wanted to give a shout out to all my workers. We couldn't do it without you. And the people that helped put back chairs. There's so much water in that. What is that? You're fine. It's just me, the Lord. <laughs> Maybe somebody's trying to tell me something. Anyway, thank you. The Red Cross was so impressed with us. And this is the main point I wanted to share. We shared Christ with them yesterday. We took people on tours. We told them about our church. There's some that's going to watch on Facebook Live this morning. I hope you're watching this morning. And we wanted them to know that we love them. 
and they want to come twice a year now. I said, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> but we was able to show them the love of Christ, and that's my main goal on this blood drive, not just to give blood. So thank you all for coming out and supporting, especially those that gave and gave the big power red like Pastor Terry. Woo! All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Amen. We appreciate everybody that came and, and gave some blood. Let me just uh, read some names to you of our prayer list. Uh, Kevin Roach, Princess Curtis, our little buddy Gabriel, which I see he's not here again today, so we need to continue to remember him. Carrie Johnson, Carl Vaughn, Dennis Hogsett, Xavier Black, uh, Rusty Bowling, Sharon Jenkins, which is uh, Shelly's mom. Remember Virginia Bliss, which is Robert Young, the pastor at uh, First Baptist in Burlington, his mom. Jim Smith, which we were getting some good reports on that he uh, woke up the other yesterday or, or Friday night. So we're thankful for that. Mac Shope, Steve Atkins, Rodney Wilson, uh, Larry Goo, Bud Edwards, Mary Plaster, Larry Lucas, which is uh, Melissa's dad and Nancy's brother. Ivy Thompson, uh, pastor of... Uh, Pastor Farley's family, most of you know, he passed away on Wednesday morning. Um, I served under him for 12 years and uh, 12 incredible years at Jefferson Avenue. And so we're praying for his family. Uh, Terry Lister, Linda Edwards, uh, Jerry Atkins, which is Betty Grizzle's uh, brother. He's at the uh, hospice house and, and I text with Betty this morning. We need to continue to remember Jerry and then uh, Palmer Kraft, which is Chris Carnes' grandson is in the hospital. Would you stand with us? Anybody out there got a need this morning? I don't care what it is, spiritual, physical, financial, emotional. Hold your hand up there and keep it for just a minute. Look around. We ain't alone, right? We're all together in this thing, but we serve a really big God who's able to do all things. So let's take these needs to him in prayer. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this day that you have made for us. We rejoice and we are glad in it. Thank you, Lord, for being a God in heaven that's not far removed from our circumstances, but a God that's intensely involved in our lives, and for that we're thankful. So we present to you the needs that are represented on our prayer list, those that are represented by an uplifted hand. We ask you to reach down from the throne room of heaven and supply every need. God, as you do that, let us hear testimonies that will help us then to be overcomers, not just by the blood of the Lamb, but by the word of testimony. I pray, God, as we hear those, that we would just increase our faith and increase our hope, increase our trust in you. God, I pray this morning you'll bless those who give in the offering and multiply that offering for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Once again, let everything that we do point somebody to Jesus Christ. We love you. We praise you and we bless you for it's in Christ's name that we pray. Someone shout amen. I wonder if you could just bless his name right now. Can you just whisper it a few more times that you're going to see that victory? Come on, just whisper it just a couple more times. Here we go. time. Lord, we bless you. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. Turn around to three or four people and shake their hand, hug their neck, bump their knuckles, tweak their cheek. As you're doing that, I'm going to ask Del Preston to come and uh, switch microphones so they can hear you better on this one than that one. And after him, Holly. Uh, so last year, um, our church took over the Upward League, as some of you all may know, uh, and we are continuing with that this year. We've changed it from Upward to something else just to be less expensive for the parents. Um, and, and while we, we get to see a victory in that, um, I, I can't do it all myself, and I need some help. Um, and the biggest way I need help right now, sponsors. Each year we, we get the opportunity to bring in 100, 150, 200 kids and we get to minister to them every week. We get to minister them throughout the week. 
but we can only do this if I have money to paint lines, to buy jerseys, to buy socks, to pay refs, to have a concession stand, to do all this stuff. So if you are a business owner and you would like to sponsor a team, now's your opportunity. If you are just a family who wants to help some kids out, we'll take that money too. Um, season starts in about a month and a half from now. Uh, but if you would like to sponsor a team, usually it's a logo of your business on the shirt. Um, depending on how much you can sponsor, we'll put a banner out in front of the field. And it's just some good advertising for you. Uh, but what this really does is it just gives us the opportunity to keep the league running and to minister to children. And I know last year I was really stressed about it, and my, um, my amazing significant other said, did God tell you to minister to these kids? Stop worrying about it. And we already have the victory. I, I, just, I just need it out of your pockets. God's got all the money he needs. It's just in our pockets. Amen. I don't know where Holly is at. She was supposed to give us another. I know she needs money for Winterfest, so I'll just tell you, hey, Holly needs money for Winterfest. If you have uh, committed to sponsoring a kid to go or uh, promised to supply something, uh, do that. And if she comes in in a minute, I'll just stop what I'm doing and let her have No, I won't either. But anyway, just uh, help those kids out get to Winterfest. Um, come back tonight at six. We're going to continue our series on making choices. And I think we've, we've, uh, not had a, uh, a, a sermon in that series for about four weeks. So we're going to pick that up tonight and continue that series, making the right choices. And I, I hope you'll come back. Let me again, just say thank you for uh, all the cards, the letters, the text messages, the phone calls, the hugs, uh, as uh, Jerry and I uh, went through funeral of our mother and, and uh, this is I, I confess it's a little just weird I guess is the only word I can use uh, to be here this morning and 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 to know that uh, uh, she's not watching Facebook live or well, she's just watching it live I guess do they have Facebook in heaven no it's of the devil <laughs> no. um, but anyway I, I appreciate everything that you guys have done just uh, your amazing amazing group of people um, I was, uh, I think I said last week, and, and again, it, it is an example of humble brag. I mean, all of the likes, my thumb is so sore, all the likes of all the comments. You're just, you're incredible people, and I appreciate it so much, and I know my family does too. So let's get into this morning and talk for a few minutes about our fourth sermon in this series of casual or committed Christian. Are you a casual or a committed Christian. And what we're talking about is what's it going to take for me to quit being a casual fan and just become a committed follower of Christ. I don't just don't want to be an enthusiastic admirer. I want to be committed in who I am to the things of Christ. The first week, what we looked at real quickly was uh, Jesus was uh, teaching in John chapter 6 and he gave away some free food and people were hanging around. But once the food was gone, the buffet was closed. A lot of people left. And what we found out was that when Jesus had the big crowds around him, he said the hard things. And that, those hard things caused people to leave. And I apologize then and I repent now because sometimes we try to make Jesus palatable for everybody. We try to just talk about the nice things about Jesus to attract them. But what we found out was Jesus is not concerned about the size of a crowd. He's more concerned with the level of our commitment. How committed are we to the things of God? And then the third week we took a look at the truth. And this is such a big issue, not just with unbelievers, but this is such a big issue with believers, and we're going to get into it a little bit more today, because would you want to know the truth, even if it's absolutely different than what you've always believed? Would you want to know the truth, even if it's totally different than what you currently know about God? Some people say, hey, listen, I believe what I believe, and that's that, and there's nothing you can do about it. And you might say, hey, Pastor Terry, you believe what you believe, and that's that. 
Well, if you want to try to change what I believe, come at me, bro. Come on. I mean, I'm ready for you. But would you want to know the truth even if it was totally different than what you currently know? And so last time we looked at that relationship between Nicodemus and Jesus and those three words that every man runs from, we had to define the commitment, the relationship. We had to define that. And what we saw in Nicodemus was this incredible transformation from being a casual follower to being a committed follower as we saw his life kind of go through four phases. Because when we first read about Nicodemus, he met Jesus under the cover of darkness, right? Second time we see he's defending Jesus in the Sanhedrin. The third time we read about him, he's bringing ingredients to anoint Christ's body after his crucifixion. And then tradition tells us that he was martyred for the cause, that Nicodemus actually ended up giving his life for the cause of Christ, which brings us to this morning. And we'll talk about the open invitation, the open invitation. Lord, I pray this morning that you will open our hearts, open our minds, let us set aside preconceived ideas, let us set aside traditions of men, let us set aside those things that distract us, let us set aside those things that detour us, and let us this morning get serious about our commitment to you. Let us this morning not just make a decision for Christ, but let us make a commitment to follow you. I pray, Lord, that you'll give me the words to say, not just what's on an iPad, but let me speak what we need to hear from you this morning. I thank you for that, and I ask it in Christ's name. Someone say amen. You ever seen those uh, car commercials where it says that anyone can buy a car here until you read down at the bottom where it says as long as you can pass our credit application, right? Anyone doesn't really mean anyone. Anyone means if you can pass a certain criteria. Or maybe it was your cell phone. I don't know about you, but I've been an AT&T customer since before they were AT&T. Anybody remember Singular? Then AT and Tingular, and some of you remember the AT and T. I mean, for 30 years I've been an AT and T customer, and then they they get these new commercials out where you can get this phone for nothing, right? And when you call as a 30 year user of their of their service, you can't use that that new phone. You can't get that new phone. Well, that'll cost you this many hundred dollars because you got to buy out of your current contract to get this. So anyone really doesn't mean anyone, whether it's a car, whether it's a phone. And it sure seems like that whenever people say anyone is welcome, that's not really what they mean. It just seems like when someone says anyone is welcome, there seems to always be a catch. Seems to always be some kind of a hook that says, well, anyone doesn't really mean anyone. Yet we read in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, which is a verse we used the last time we were here two weeks ago, where Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, he must first what? Deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. And so you see that word anyone, and you wonder just what did Jesus mean to potential followers when he said anyone, anyone who wants to come after me must do these three things. Who was he really talking about? Well, I think there was four things he was saying in there, and so let's just cover them real quickly this morning before we pray. Number one, he said anyone... And that means anyone is welcome. Think about that for just a minute. Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow me, you're welcome to do so. And in the church over the years, we've kind of gotten to the point where when we hear Jesus say anyone, we think, what's the catch? It's got to be a hook here somewhere. It can't really mean anyone because I've got this past that Jesus surely wouldn't understand. I've done these things that Jesus surely... So there's got to be a catch in here. But the truth of the matter is there's no catch. I'm proud to announce to you this morning that with Jesus Christ, there's no small print. When he says anyone, guess what he means? Anyone. There's no hidden fees. Well, tithe and offering, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> there's no hidden fees. There's no small print. Anyone means anyone. And here's what we need to understand before we look at the second thing that I think Jesus meant when he said that, is that in Jesus's day, Jesus was considered a rabbi. Now that's not really uh, debatable. That's not really negotiable. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher of God's word. And in Jesus's day, 
A teacher of God's word was a teacher of the Old Testament. You know, those, those books that begin with Genesis and end with Malachi. And Jesus, even though he was homeless, even though he was unconventional, even though he was different than all the rest of them, he was a rabbi. Now, rabbis had these people that wanted to follow them called tall meads. Say it with me, tall mead. Or you can say students. Students are a lot easier to say. And who were these guys? They were people that were wanting to be a disciple of, a student of the rabbi. As a matter of fact, literally the word means, tall mead means to be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Think about that for a minute. I want to be a follower of Jesus and I want to be so close to him that I'm covered by the dust of my rabbi. That's what a tall mead was. And so essentially every rabbi had a group of students. This was an incredibly exclusive group of students. Think about this for just a minute. Most people didn't end up being students of a rabbi. As a matter of fact, uh, if you didn't make the cut, what you ended up doing was you began to learn a trade from your family because you knew you were not going to be a student of the rabbi. You became a stonemason, a fisherman, a tradesman, a carpenter. And those students that were wanting to become tall meads, though, there was a, uh, a, a, an application process that you had to go through. It's, a, it's kind of a, a unique and very difficult process. First, there's some really heavy prerequisites if you wanted to be a follower of a particular rabbi, equivalent to what I would say is our GPA in today's world, uh, a transcript prerequisite, if you will. Matter of fact, anybody here that wants to go to Harvard, you know, you got to have a 4.0 or score 32 on the ACT or 1600 on the SAT. It was kind of like that. If you wanted to be a follower of Jesus or of a rabbi, a teacher, there were some prerequisites. And when people heard, now, I know what some of you think is, well, Pastor Terry, you, you kind of been out of the pocket for over a week and maybe you've lost your way. No, listen carefully to what I'm trying to say. There were rabbis in Jesus's day. And if you wanted to be a follower of that rabbi, you had to follow a certain prerequisite of standards, but then all of a sudden, here comes this guy saying, anyone. I don't, I see, I felt those old Pentecostal chill bumps. You know what you talk about, those chill bumps? I felt that just then. That I don't have to have a 4.0. That I don't have to have a 32 ACT or a 1600 SAT. As a matter of fact, when Jesus said, anyone who wants to follow me, Anybody that wants to be my student, all the people had to do was look at who was already following him to know there was no requirements, right? Had a couple of fishermen, a couple of political hotheads, and a tax collector. Those were not candidates to be tall meads. Am I talking to myself this morning? You better talk to me or we'll be here all day. Listen. The tall maid had to have this impressive knowledge of scripture. If they came to the rabbi and said, I want to be your student, the rabbi would begin to quiz that prospective student. They'd begin to ask them some questions. They might ask them to recite an entire book of the Old Testament. I'm pretty sure most all of us would be in trouble right there. Most all of us. Now, there's a few of you perfect people out there. You probably got it memorized and God bless you. They might even ask them to tell them the number of times that the word Lord is used in the 11th chapter of Leviticus. And again, I'm pretty sure most of us wouldn't know the answer to that question. Now think about this. This was a very intense, painstaking process. If somebody wanted to be a follower of a rabbi, it was very painstaking. It was very intense because, listen to this, the excellence of the student reflected the excellence of the teacher, right? So if a teacher wanted to have a good reputation, he would select only the best. I am so glad to be able to say this morning that that was not Jesus. Because again, most of us, now some of you that are adjusting your halo and getting your pin feathers all situated, you're fine. But most of the rest of us wouldn't make the cut. He changed the system. And I hope you're listening this morning because especially when he invited a tax collector to follow him. Come on, most of us say, no, all tax collectors are going straight to, you know, they're not going no way. 
So when word gets out that this new rabbi is some, picking some followers at random, if you could just put yourself in the first century of Palestine at, at that time and at that moment, think about a rabbi who's saying, anyone can come and follow me. And what that would have meant to people. How liberating that would have been to some people that thought, I'll never be able to be a tall mead. I'll never be able to be a student. I'll never be able to be covered by my rabbi's dust because I can't meet the qualifications. Now listen, if you knew about me what God knows about me, you'd never listen to me. Amen. Because I don't... <laughs> I love you, Michael Aaron. Because I don't meet the qualifications. And I got news for you. You don't either. None of us do. It's not about how good I am and how correct I do things and how hard I work for the kingdom. It's because Jesus said anyone, period, anyone who wants to follow me. And so when he makes that claim, I know some of you are really nervous because like you said there were four points and this is, you're still on the first one. We're going to be here all day. Just, it, it'll be okay. We'll, we'll get through the other ones really quick. But this one we need to understand or we're not going to understand the other three. When Jesus starts making this claim, guess what happens? A bunch of people start following Jesus because they start thinking, I can be a student of the rabbi and I don't have to have a 32 ACT. I don't have to have a 1600 SAT. I don't have to have a 4.0. Anybody can follow me. I mean, look, he's got the fishermen and the political hotheads there and the tax collector. If they can follow him, surely I can follow him. And Jesus makes this invitation. And when people heard it, they came to listen to this incredible rabbi who says, you could be my student. You could be my follower. You can come after me. And all those people who had given up the dream of ever being a follower of Christ, and I hope somebody listens to me right now. All those people who said, I'll never meet the qualifications. Jesus opened the door and said, y'all come. <laughs> he said, anybody, anyone who wants to follow me. And they realized that when he said anyone, he meant it. He wasn't kidding. And when he said anyone, it's also true that the second point would be anyone means everyone. Anyone means everyone. But here's the struggle. Here's the struggle with this second point. And, and we would never admit it. Most of us would never say it. We don't always buy into the idea that the church is for everybody. We got a hidden code. Oh, got real quiet just then. Maybe just an altar call right now, you think? Think about this for just a minute. We kind of like church the way it is. I can't believe Pastor Terry put them white pool noodles up on the back wall. <laughs> Mark Sparks, some of you know Mark. He was our youth pastor here for several years. He was up this past week, and he said, man, I saw the pictures on Facebook, but take them out there and let me see what you've done. And I come out there, he goes, white pool noodles. <laughs> I'm sure some of you don't like that. That's, and that's Okay. I'm just trying to point out the fact that we kind of like church the way it is. We don't want no changes because change could be messy. Change could rub against us the wrong way. And what happens is that we usually prefer just to stay the same. Don't introduce no new songs, Linda. Well, let's see, I got a well and an O. <laughs> don't introduce nothing new. Don't challenge me. I like things the way they are. I don't want things to get messy. But here's the problem. When we like things to stay the way that they are, pretty soon what same is becomes standard. And standard becomes tradition. Larry, I, I, I can't stay here very long. I would like to because I know your heart. Man, there are so many things. Mark 7 and 8 tells us that we have gone away from God's law and begin to follow the traditions of men. You can go to churches across this country and around this globe, and you're going to find theology practice in so many different ways. It's kind of ridiculous. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. I wasn't there, so I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that was not what God had in mind. And so what does it mean 
When Jesus steps into the first century, see, we think the first great reformation was Martin Luther. No, the first great reformation was when Jesus stepped into this system and says, no, we don't have to do it that way no more. Can you imagine the people? Can you imagine the tall meads who did meet the qualifications, who heard Jesus say, no, 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 it's anybody. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. I've been in this church for 50 years. Let me tell you how it's going. I'll stay over here. I'll stay right here. And I've heard it. I've heard it. Not so much in this church, although I've heard it in our church. We're only 16 years old, so they can't say I've been here 50 years because we've only been 16. But I've been to other churches. And Jesus is kicking the door in saying, nope, ain't going to be like that no more. We're going to do it this way, anybody. Well, well, Jesus, I, I did this and I did that. Don't care. Some of you are getting a little nervous. Think about this. I think Jesus, <laughs> I know it is, Larry. I'm going to listen to it. I think Jesus knew how things would go when he did this. I think he knew it. I think he knew he was going to make the religious people mad. Listen to me very carefully. It's not Easter, and so I won't stay here. But he made them so mad they wanted to kill him. I hope hope some of you can hold back your emotion just a little bit (laughs) that you don't want that. But listen, the simple fact is when he says anyone, he means everyone. When he says anyone, he means everyone. And so Jesus does away with the qualifications to follow. He gets rid of this long list of prerequisites and he did away with this standard application process that if you wanted to be a follower, you could be a follower. And I hope this doesn't cause anyone to want to leave the fellowship of Tri-State Worship Center. But I think we ought to do the same thing. I think we ought to just do away with all the qualifications. You need to, well, you know, you need to learn the meaning of the word perpetuation before you can come and be. You need to smell like us and look like us and talk like us and walk like us. I mean, the dressing like us is really not that hard to do. Anybody, Anybody can do this. Well, not anybody can make it look as good as I do, but anybody can do this. I got it, man. Thank you very much. But we don't talk about it. We just usually don't talk about this unwritten code that we have. We don't. Over the past few decades, there's, there's not only been this unwritten code in churches about you know, how we talk and walk, but there's, there's been unwritten codes about your political slant. If you're not of a certain political slant, you couldn't be a Christian. I've heard that so many times. Who are are you or who am I to decide whether someone's a Christian or not? That's the reason why the church is in decline around the globe. It's because of our unwritten code that we use to judge everybody else by. You don't believe it the way I believe it, you're in trouble. Most churches, they even add a lot of things to the unwritten code that were not God's law. They were just traditions of men. And whether or not you should listen to a certain style of music, what your income was, what your social agenda is, what your church denomination is, the list stacks up quickly. I mean, you can just start adding to it. And suddenly we make that the standard. But the church keeps saying anyone is welcome. We keep saying that. But do we mean that? I mean, do we really mean that? Because when you look at how many members want to think about how they dress and the political things and the style of music, it becomes clear that we do have qualifications for people to come to church and they shouldn't be there. Jesus said, get rid of them. Anyone is everyone. He eliminated the qualifications. And so by doing that, it leads us to the third point. Anyone is welcome. Anyone is everyone. But he also said no qualifications means that you don't have any excuses now. Well, I can't go to that church because. Oh, no. Jesus removed all those. No qualifications, no excuses. Anyone who wants to follow me must first deny themselves, pick up their cross daily, follow me. That's it. 
You don't have to have a certain good memory to memorize scripture. You don't have to just follow Jesus. Just do what he tells you to do. And when he invites anyone to follow him, he doesn't just break down those barriers of those unwritten codes. He gets rid of all the excuses as well. Well, I can't go to church because the church is full of hypocrites. There's room for more. Come on. We got room for one more. He removes all of that. So now, here, this, so now, the ones who wanted to be students that couldn't meet the qualifications, who had gone away to learn their father's trade, hear about Jesus saying, listen, if you want to follow me, just come on. And that excites them. Suddenly, they're excited about the fact that they're not stuck in a trade any longer, but they can actually be covered by the dust of the teacher. All of a sudden, it doesn't matter what I did and who I am and who I'm connected to and how long I've been here or what my mom and dad did. All of a sudden, it's about, do I know Jesus? And so these tradesmen had no, no excuses. Excuses are gone. You want to follow the rabbi? Follow the rabbi. All of a sudden, the high school dropout has no excuse. You want to be covered by the dust of the teacher? You can be covered by the dust of the teacher. Now the mother of four who's trying to raise those children on her own, has no excuse. Oh, all of a sudden it got real, didn't it? All of a sudden the person who's putting in so many hours at the office because they're trying to take care of their family, you don't have an excuse anymore. Person that says, I can't sing, you don't have an excuse anymore. Person that says, well, you know, I really, I'm not a good public speaker. I wouldn't be able to share my testimony with anybody. You don't have an excuse. There are no excuses anymore. Those are gone. Jesus said anyone. And when he said anyone, he meant everyone. And when he meant everyone, he got rid of the qualifications, which means there's no more excuses. Yes, sir. Others say it's because it, they've got a past that they're not proud of. Well, you know, pastor, I, I would follow the Lord, but man, I've done so many things wrong in my life. So the baggage of addiction and the baggage of trial and the baggage of different things from the past is going to give you an excuse. I mean, you've been using it for a long time, but I'm here to announce in your presence this morning that Jesus said all the excuses are gone. They're gone. You don't have them anymore because he said anyone. And, and the, the easy thing to do is for us to hide behind those excuses See, I, I, those of you that are attenders at Tri-State Worship Center, this comes as no surprise to you. Those of you that this might be your first or second time here, this may be a deal breaker for you. I ain't always been this good, okay? <laughs> I mean, there was a time in my life I was an awful, awful, awful person. Awful person. All of the addictive behaviors, I, I, I didn't mind fighting with people because I was usually bigger than they were. But yet that always attracted people that wanted to fight me. You know, they always wanted to get the big guy. If we can take the big guy down, everybody will see us. I was, I was just a terrible, terrible person. But then there was one day when Jesus removed all my excuses. And he said, you know what? If you want to follow me, come on. But the problem in the church today, the problem in the Christianity today is we say, you want to follow Jesus? Well, here's the three steps that you got to Jesus didn't do that. It's easy for us to hide behind the excuses because who's going to argue with someone who's been through tragedy? Who's going to argue with someone who's been through these different emotionally scarred events in your life? Nobody's going to argue with that. I get it. It's bad. It's terrible, but it's not an excuse. Yeah. Matter of fact, you're letting it be an excuse to keep you from getting the healing that you need. Amen. You're letting it be an excuse to keep you from being an overcomer yeah. like you should be, like he wants us to be. And you're keeping it as an excuse to keep you from getting covered by the dust of your rabbi. Because when Jesus got rid of all the excuses, he invites anyone. Anyone means everyone. Anyone's welcome to have a relationship with Jesus. You say, well, I have a sexual past. Anyone. Ex-con. Inmate. Recently divorced multiple divorces. Anyone? 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 
What about the alcoholic? Anyone. I hope you're not just saying this. I hope it's finding its way to your heart. Hallelujah. Are you listening? Yes. What about the pot? What about the pothead? Oh, what about the drug addict? Come on. What about the hypocrite? Anyone. You got quieter on that one. <laughs> what happened? What about the casual follower? Oh, anyone. anyone. Yes. Now listen, if this makes it its way to our heart, we need to be ready for what can happen when we embrace the invitation to anyone. Yes. Hello? Are you listening? Because if anyone comes to church, that, that'll mean they'll kind of be messy. Yes. Come on. Now, we can sit here and say we're ready for that. But I'm here to tell you, I, I served in a church once where uh, I ended up being in charge of the transportation ministry. And on Wednesday nights, we were bringing about 180 kids to church on vans and buses. And while that church said they were ready for it, they weren't. And unfortunately, it lasted for about six months and the whole program died because they just weren't ready for it. They weren't ready for people who weren't raised in church. They, they didn't, kids that didn't know you're supposed to take your ball cap off. Listen, I'm for taking your ball cap off. I'll look around real quick. I don't see any. This morning. I think the respectful thing is to take your hat off. But if you don't know about that, who am I to put this qualification on you? Come on. I'm not going to say it doesn't bother me. Because it does. But I can't say that should keep you from coming to church because you wear a ball cap or wear it backwards or don't curve the bill. Listen, get rid of the flat bill thing. That's, that's just... And curve that thing. Come on. And don't buy it big enough to fit over your ears. That's just... I don't get that. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm almost done. You just have to tolerate me just a few more minutes. Here's what happens. All of a sudden, the church gets filled with unchurched people. And you know what? Here's a crazy thought. That's what we're here for. Yay! Isn't that crazy? We think it's just so that we can come in and sing these great songs that have great messages that enthuse us, right? Excite us. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that we're just carnally being enthused. You know, the definition of enthusiasm is in theos, God in us. So we get enthused and that's good. Matter of fact, some of you could stand to get a little bit more of that. Um, but it's not just about us. As a matter of fact, I'm going to make this comment and, and I hope you understand where I'm coming from. Then I'll go to point four. We'll finish. You guys can go eat whatever's in the crock pot. If this church is not growing with unchurched people, on, something's wrong. Yeah. Something's wrong. We have a, I hear it from anybody and everybody that's ever touched anything about this church, how great this church is. Yesterday, some of the people from Red Cross were telling me how wonderful everybody was and what a great facility. And when I told them about the white pool noodles, they didn't believe me. And I said, listen, when you hit those with colored lights, they turn different. Oh, no. I showed them a picture and they're like, oh. <laughs> everybody talks about how great this church is. Well, then how come we're not running two services or three services and the, and the place is packed out every service? You say, Pastor Terry, you're just looking for a raise. No, it won't mean a raise for me. It would mean a race for the kingdom. Amen. So if we're going to say, listen, anybody means everybody, and there's no qualifications, all the excuses are gone now, how come the place isn't full? I'm just, that's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer it out loud because I got to move on. Committed followers are willing to listen to the stories of brokenness of people and realize here is an incredible candidate for Jesus. Amen. I think, I know I, I need to quit. I think one of the best services that we've ever had was when we were still over what is now the funeral home. And that particular morning, we had three people with us that had come from an alcohol binge one of them so bad they couldn't even set up in a chair. We let them lay down on a couch that was in the foyer over there. 
A couple of people that had been on crack cocaine for about a, a week without any sleep. And it was, I mean, you look at them, you could just tell. And there were a couple of young ladies there that I knew the family and I knew what their occupation was. And they were strippers. And I thought, Jesus is looking down right now with such a smile on his face on, saying, they get it. They get it. They get it. It's not just about I got it, right? It's about, I got it. And I want you to have this. I once was lost. You might be lost, but we can be found because Jesus said, anyone, anyone, anyone is welcome. Anyone means everyone. No qualifications means no excuses. Last thing I'll say, it's anyone, but it's everything. Anyone can come but it will cost us everything that we are. Amen. I'm not up here promoting, let people come to church and just be who they are and accept the things that they do. No, that's, listen, if you know me at all, you know, that's not what I'm saying. There, there are things that people have in their life that Jesus needs to take care of. And quite frankly, I, I, I don't want some lay person doing heart surgery on me. I want a surgeon to do heart surgery on me. Anybody see the connection? Let me tell you about Jesus, but Jesus has got to make that change in that person. So everything's not acceptable. And I don't want you to think that when Jesus makes the invitation, he welcomes anyone that would come after him, but it's anyone. And that means it's everything. He makes it clear that when you choose to follow him, you're giving up everything. When the tall mead was finally accepted into this rabbi school, they would leave their home, their job, whatever it was that was holding them back, and they would go after that rabbi so that they could be covered in his dust. Linda, Linda if you'll come. Maybe this silly illustration might help somebody. Michael, Aaron, come here and help me. I know your grandpa's probably said that to you a couple times. Come here and help me <laughs> preach, Michael, Aaron. I want you to be the tall me wherever I go, you go. Right? Follow me closely. And it didn't matter where the rabbi went. They were following so close that they were covered by his dust. So if he went to the store, they went to the store with him. Don't leave Jesus outside the Walmart doors. There's a lot of people in Walmart that need Jesus, okay? Amen. Can I get an amen? And if Jesus goes to the auto body shop, don't leave Jesus out. Well, Jesus ain't going to be outside Harless's shop because they're going to take him in anyway. But don't leave Jesus at, at the door, right? So the tall maid's going to follow the rabbi wherever he goes. <laughs> you guys are like, please don't come over here. Please don't come over. Please don't. The tall maid, he is, is he still back there? Is he pretty close? And so no matter where I go, he goes because he wants to be covered by the dust of his teacher. Right? And so if I go to the store, if I go to the auto repair place, if I'm at home, if I'm watching a television program, my tall mead is following. Now I'm not, there's no way I would ever claim to be Jesus. I think you know that. But that's how we should be following Jesus. Wherever he goes. And when he goes to the least of these, you guys are not the least of these, but I'm just want to use you as a, when he goes to the least of these, it's not just Jesus. It's the tall me going with him. And he says, anyone means anyone. No qualifications, no excuses. I'm talking, hey, what's up? I'm talking to this section right here. You got no excuse. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. No excuses. You want to be a follower? Be a follower. Now, tall me, when we get back over here, you can go sit down because I, I don't want you getting, you know, too much of my dust. What about you? What excuses have you been using? Because really, Jesus said, if anyone chooses to follow me, anyone, and when he said anyone, he meant anyone. You say, well, Pastor Terry, I, you know, I, just, I did this, I did that. I've been married six times, whatever the case might be. Was it five? Five times. You know, sometimes you lose, lose track. You know, some of you. It doesn't matter what it, it doesn't matter. 
And, and we're, we're going to pray. We, we got to go. But I, I need you to understand that even your pastor daily, daily has to stay close to the rabbi. And I know when there's days that I don't stay close and I can begin to feel the distance. I don't know if, if you know what that feels like, but that's not a good feeling. The distance is not a good feeling. I want to be so close. The dust from his sandals covers my life. Because I know if that happens, his blood covers my life. Stand with me. Stand with me. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Say it. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Lord, we thank you this morning that you are such an awesome God. God that loves us so much that you sent your son to die for us that if we would just believe we would not perish but we would have everlasting life we know that in believing it changes who we are because belief plus believer determines behavior and when we believe it does change who we are but to believe there are no qualifications to believe there are no excuses we simply have faith that you are God and that you're telling us the truth and that you sent your son to die for us. And we make that choice. After that choice, yes, our life will be challenged and changed. But to make the choice is simply to follow after you. So help us this morning, Lord God, as we wrestle with that, as we struggle with that in Christ's name. Keep your heads bowed for just a moment. You might be here this morning and not in a right relationship or not in a close relationship with Jesus. And if that's you this morning, Listen, anyone means anyone. Doesn't matter where you came from, who you are. Doesn't matter what your background is. Doesn't matter what your social economic status is. What matters is that you would make a choice to believe in Christ. That's what matters. And then let Jesus take care of the rest. I saw a bumper sticker that said, you love them, I'll take care of the rest, God. And I, I believe that. I believe if we love people, lead them to Christ, We'll let God take care of the rest. He may use us to change people. He may use us to help people. But we'll let him take care of it. So if you're here this morning, you're not in a right relationship with Christ. We're going to sing this chorus through just a couple more times. And as we sing it, I'd love to pray with you. But the decision is up to you. You were created with a mind of your own, a will to do what you want to do. So if that's you, would you come? I'm going to see you. two things and we're going to be dismissed. Number one, if you're here this morning and that was you and you knew there was a tug on your heart, it's never too late. I don't care if it's in a church or in the bathroom at home. You can always pray a prayer that says, I'm a sinner. I need forgiven. Thank you, Lord. You can do that any, anywhere, anytime. Secondly, if you're here this morning and you are a believer, it's time to get off the fence. We're either committed followers of Christ or we're not. Matter of fact, Jesus said in his revelation to the church through John while he's on the Isle of Patmos, I would rather you be hot or cold because if you're lukewarm, you're not going to know that you're not hot. You're going to think you're okay. And that makes me sick. That's what he said. And so we got to be committed followers of Christ. Every aspect of our life surrendered to him. No excuses. 
He's the Lord of my life. He's the Lord of my family. He's the Lord of the church. He's the Lord of my wallet. He's the Lord. And we have to be that kind of a committed follower. And we have to say, anything means everyone and everyone can make things messy, but that's okay. That's okay. That's, that's what Jesus, I mean, who did he go? How many stories in the Bible that you read where he was with people that nobody else wanted to be around? And he says, we're supposed to be doing what he, what he did. So I hope that we'll be that way. I pray you'll continue to remember my wife in prayer. It's so weird not being in church with my wife. I mean, I've known Vicki since she was seven years old and we always went to the same church together. And then when she's not here, I feel like half of me is gone. Now I'm not saying she's half of my size or because she's smaller than that. But just remember her in prayer that she'll get better. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. I love you. If you have any questions about any of this stuff, you know what to do. Don't talk to your neighbor. Talk to me. I'll be glad to answer any questions you got. God bless you.